It was 1898 when the SS Mohegan sank off the coast of Cornwall. And though we know what damaged the ship, there's still a lot of mystery around why it happened. The ship should have never sailed as close to the shore as it did. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Let's dive in and explore the mysterious sinking of the SS Mohegan. Now, this case is actually one that was mentioned in a comment on my video about the SS Stella. It really caught my interest, because this one felt even more mysterious. But to get to why, we have to start from the beginning. The Mohegan only sailed one full passenger carrying voyage before meeting her end on the second one, and yet she had quite the eventful history. She was built as the Cleopatra, a mixed passenger liner and animal carrier. She was built by the Earl's Shipbuilding and Engine Company in Hull, England and launched in April 1898. Originally the Cleopatra was intended for the Wilson and Furness Leyland line, but purchased by the Atlantic Transport line before getting finished. The ship was fitted with lavish interiors, as expected at the time, and a big focus was put on her safety. She was equipped with eight watertight bulkheads, fail-safe lighting and pumping systems, eight lifeboats and three compasses. She could carry 120 first-class passengers and had stalls for 700 cattle. So after all this, you'd think she was a well-crafted ship but I have to tell you otherwise. A strike by the shipyard workers held up the construction for a while and thus the shipbuilders had to rush her construction and skimp over specifications. Why? Because if they didn't deliver the ship in time, they would have definitely faced a penalty. So. On July 31st, 1898, when the Cleopatra sailed onto her maiden voyage towards New York, it was not smooth sailing. Passengers complained about the many defects of the ship, but praised how the crew handled the situation. And the crew definitely had a hard time, as there was a malfunction of the water system that fed the boilers, and a number of serious leaks which meant she leaked so alarmingly that the crew struggled to keep her operational. Once arriving in New York on August 12th, she had to be docked for the most urgent repairs. Then she was sent back to England, with crew only, no passengers and that at half speed, which meant the trip took 21 days. Once docked, she underwent a massive overhaul, which took 41 days. Only then the Board of Trade declared her fit for sailing and the Cleopatra was renamed into the Mohegan, giving her a fresh start. Interestingly enough, she was ranked A1 at Lloyd's of London when originally built. The Maritime Classification Company ranked ships based on their quality of construction for insurance purposes. And A1 is a very good ranking. Funny how that turned out. But yes, being good to go, the Mohegan set out on a second voyage on October 13th, 1898. Bound for New York, the Mohegan left Tilbury with Captain Griffiths in command. She had 57 passengers, 97 crew and 7 cattlemen aboard, and her general cargo consisted mostly of beer and spirits, but also church ornaments, artificial flowers and antimony. The passengers did include several wealthy people, an opera singer, bankers, also the father of famous dancer Isadora Duncan with his second wife and a young daughter. Apparently there was also a stowaway aboard, as found out later. To make space for more cattle, there was no steerage class and thus many of her passengers were cows and horses. The trip went on and the Mohegan arrived off Dover at 7.30 that same evening, dropping her pilot who guided her out of port. A report on the progress so far was made by the assistant engineer and was most likely passed off to land at this point. 
The report stated that there were a few minor leaks and electrical failures, but otherwise no major problems. Honestly, I'm surprised that even now there were issues like that. But to give the benefit of the doubt, ships often had troubles when they were very new, and some people preferred taking ships that had been settled in properly. After leaving Dover, the Mohegan sailed down the English Channel at her maximum speed, and the voyage seemed like a smooth crossing. The next day, at 2.40 p.m., the ship signaled all's well, report to me to the signal station at Prawl Point, Devon. Later that day, she was also seen off Ramehead signal station, but that time no signal was given and the ship disappeared out of sight. The Mohegan was passing Cornwall and at 6.30 p.m. the dinner gong sounded. Her passengers would have certainly been dressed in lavish attire for dinner and began to sit down to enjoy themselves. Really, they had no idea of the horror that was beginning to unfold. But outside, everyone was becoming aware that something was not right. The crew did notice that the shore was too close and the Eddystone lighthouse was too far, and yet the full speed of 13 knots was kept on. On the shore, the ship had become more and more visible and people were surprised. The Mohegan was well lit and people described the scene as bright as day or lit up like a city. John May, who acted as duty coast guard officer at Coverick, saw this too and acted immediately by firing off some signal rockets as a warning, which the Mohegan did not respond to. James Hill, coxswain of the Port Eustock lifeboat, saw the ship and realized it had no right to be this close to shore. He could tell that the Mohegan was headed straight for the Manacle rocks, so he shouted, she's coming right in, as he called for his crew and immediately prepared for the worst. 6.50 p.m. came by and finally the Mohegan's crew noticed what was happening and shut down the engines, but it was too late. The ship ran into the manacles and ripped open her hull below the waterline and broke off her rudder. The impact was barely felt and yet it ripped open the ship so much that the watertight compartments meant to save her became useless. The engine room flooded quickly and the generators were swarmed. Soon the lights turned off and that's when everyone realized it is serious and rushed to deck. Captain Griffiths acted quick and had some distress rockets fired and immediately started to get the passengers into the ship's boats. It wasn't an easy task though as the list to port, the leaning to the left side, became so severe that no starboard lifeboats could be lowered. Loading the port lifeboats proved tricky because the captain had installed a second railing to prevent rushing in the case of an emergency. The boats were loaded with frightened women and children but now the boats, which were still on deck, were too heavy to be hoisted up by the davits and so they had to be reloaded after being placed at the ship's side. Only two lifeboats made it off but one got swamped and capsized. Nothing more could be done because the ship rolled over and sank, 12 minutes after she hit the rocks. Captain Griffith's last words were reported to be, get the women into the rigging, before he slipped beneath the waves. And that's what many people on deck did, they climbed up the masts and rigging, the ropes holding them in place. It was all that remained above the water, the masts and the funnel. The port you stock lifeboat Charlotte was launched within 30 minutes and got to the scene to rescue as many people as possible. But it wasn't an easy task. One man was in the water for seven and a half hours before he was rescued. A young woman clung to the mast for over three hours before she found salvation. Some who were rescued alive did unfortunately succumb to the injuries later. The Charlotte came across the capsized lifeboat and could rescue a few from the keel of it, but apparently many had died underneath it, but not all. There was screaming that attracted the Charlotte's crew and they managed to ride the boat. There was Miss Rodenbush, the mentioned opera singer, and Mrs. Crompton Swift. Swift was stuck because her hair had become tangled with the ropes from the boat. So Frank Tripp of the Charlotte's crew took an axe to cut Mrs. Crompton Swift free, but 
This didn't go to plan. The Charlotte rolled, and he missed and slammed into the leg of another survivor, Mrs. Lizzie Small Grandon. And while Swift was able to be freed, Mrs. Grandon ended up bleeding out on the Charlotte. Several boats ended up making attempts to rescue survivors, and the Charlotte returned to the scene after unloading the first load of her passengers too. Getting people from the mast proved dangerous, so eventually people who had been holding on to them just swam for the rescue boats. The people of Port Eustock and surrounding villages welcomed the survivors with open arms and did their best to care for them, letting them stay in their private homes. But many did not make it, and many bodies were washed up on shore and taken to the bigger village of St. Kevin. Some wealthier Americans who passed were embalmed and taken back to the States, but most ended up buried in a mass grave at the yard of St. Kevin Church, which somewhat overlooks the very spot where the Mohegan sank. Instead of a detailed gravestone, a simple cross with the word Mohegan was placed over the grave. All in all, 44 people were saved and 106 lost their lives, including all of the crew. Or at least, that is what is generally assumed. You see, there's been some conspiracies about that. About the captain specifically. Three months later, a headless body was washed ashore in an officer's uniform and believed to be him. But some reports and ideas seem to play with the idea that something else happened. When the Charlotte landed, witnesses saw a man jump off and run into the dark, never to be seen again. Some assume this might have been the captain. The corpse was headless after all, though to be fair, Bodies deteriorate quickly in the water. The theories suggested that the shipping line was in financial trouble, and that maybe Captain Griffiths held shares in the company. The idea was that the ship was sunk for the insurance money. Then again, it did turn out that the ship wasn't fully insured, so that wouldn't have worked. Griffiths was also really experienced. Couldn't he have run the ship aground somewhere less dangerous? Now, the reason why fingers were pointed at the captain was that the ship was so far off the usual route and the inquiry found no result on why that was the case. The sea wasn't really bad and neither was visibility much of a problem. Though about that, I did see a theory that maybe the ship was lit too well. It was a time when electric lights on ships were still somewhat new and if the ship was so brightly lit, it could have affected the nightly vision of the crew. Which is why on modern ships you often see the bridge having a darker ambience at night. Another theory suggested that the magnetic quality of the manacle rocks had upset the compass, which led to going so far off course. But that was dismissed because it turned out the course was set by the captain himself. The Mohegan would have passed 10 to 12 nautical miles south of the manacle reef if she hadn't gone off course. Instead, at some point, her course was changed to west by north, which meant she was headed right for the manacles. But even if the crew would have managed to avoid the rocks just in time, the ship would have certainly struck the granite cliffs between Gotravi Cove and Lowland Point on the Lizard Peninsula. So while the official inquiry concluded it to be human error, there is just no good reason for why the captain would have changed the course to be so far off. My personal theory is that I really don't know. I mean, maybe it was the captain who survived and ran off. Maybe he was just really panicked. Uh, you know, the people just went through a horrible trauma. It might have been any male passenger who was so traumatized that he just ran away from the scene as far as he could. 
I also find the parallels to the Stella interesting. The comment that suggested the Mohegan also mentioned the theory about the lights, which unfortunately I couldn't find much information on. But yes, both ships had an opera singer aboard, and Willem McGonagall wrote poems about both wrecks. But most importantly, both ships ran onto well-known rocks, and the crew made a troubled decision. But the Stella sank in heavy fog and wasn't that far off course. The sea off of Cornwall is definitely treacherous, but the Mohegan would have sailed a route that was well out of harm's way. You know, it's also interesting how both disasters were just about a year apart. That being said, I don't think there's any connection, but rather that seafaring was definitely a lot more dangerous then. The wreck of the Mohegan can still be dived today. It has terribly deteriorated, with most of it having collapsed onto itself. The boilers are intact and stick out of the wreck and are the most notable way to spot it. Things taken from her were portholes, plates, brass fittings, the steam whistle and, oh yeah, a whole staircase, which can now be found at Coverack Youth Hostel in, well, Coverack. The ship's bell was also salvaged and is now at the Bell Inn in Thetford, Norfolk. The manacles were feared by many for a reason, and the Mohegan wasn't their only victim. Who knows? Maybe we'll revisit them someday. Well, as always, thank you for tuning in to Ace Vault. I'm A and I obviously own this thing. <laughs> if you like watching videos about this kind of thing, well then, shoot me a like, subscribe, you know the drill, if you want to. Anyway. I'm always looking for new topics to talk about, so if you know any rare shipwrecks or disasters or whatever else you think I could talk about, let me know. Have a nice week and I'll see you next time!